It is completely embarrassing that for all of our country's supposed innovativeness, we don't have high-speed rail connecting all the major cities in the Northeast, one of the most population and employment-rich corridors on the planet. So today I'm going to take it a step further and propose that we connect them with superconducting magnetic levitation, or maglev. I'm going to look at the history of maglev, the state of the technology, actual proposals to implement in the Northeast Corridor, and then I'm going to illustrate the benefits by comparing what a maglev glove trip would look like compared to other options on the corridor. It's pretty eye-opening and it's all coming up next. This is City Nerd, weekly content on cities and transportation, viewer suggested topics always welcome, and I've had this idea on my list for a while, but then this image made the rounds recently, in various forms. Like, I'm not going to comment on the fact that this person with 200,000 followers got 30 million views on a tweet that says they just now realized a lot of people live on the eastern seaboard of the US. Now I do think, as Americans, we're used to thinking of our country as geographically enormous with lots of open space, but the Northeast Corridor really is such a densely populated area by any measure. Here's a selection of some of the densest intercity corridors from around the world just for comparison, and how much high-speed rail service they see on a typical weekday. The northeastern U.S. compares very favorably to nearly all of these corridors in terms of density, and it has overwhelmingly more population and travel demand than any of the busiest high-speed rail corridors in the EU. I mean, it's not even particularly close. But unlike all these other countries, the U.S. does not have true high-speed rail linking the cities in its most populous region, or any other corridor for that matter. Keep in mind, while China was plowing hundreds of billions of dollars into building a high-speed rail network as part of its stimulus program, Program. In response to the financial crisis of 2008, states like Wisconsin and Ohio were sending stimulus money for rail back to President Obama because trains are socialism, I guess. But today we're talking about superconducting magnetic levitation technology. And you might ask, isn't this a bunch of theoretical hokum like the Hyperloop? And the answer is no, and it's not my intention to review in excruciating detail how the technology works. This isn't that kind of channel, and I'm sure those videos are out there. For the purposes of today's discussion, all you need to know is not only is maglev an exhaustively tested and proven technology, but it is currently implemented in Shanghai as a connection between Pudong Airport and the Central Business District, and the first true intercity line connecting Tokyo to Nagoya and eventually further west to Osaka is in construction now and was scheduled to open in 2027, but ran into permitting issues or really political gamesmanship with a local prefecture. Just just in case you were under the illusion that NIMBYism is confined to the West. But the service, Chuo Shinkansen, is going to go into operation probably decades before California high-speed rail starts revenue service, and it's going to cut the existing Takedo Shinkansen travel time by more than half. Let me pause briefly to answer a question you might have, which is why are you talking about maglev when we apparently can't even build one single high-speed rail line in the United States? Keep in mind, the Takedo Shinkansen opened in 1964, and for the last 60 years, every developed country has been implementing this technology to connect its most populated centers. So it's not as if we don't understand that the technology exists or that the Northeast Corridor is far and away the best place to make that investment. But the argument has always been, well, you'd practically have to build a whole new alignment because while there are segments that can operate up to 150 or 160 miles an hour, the geometry is substandard in most of the corridor, and there are a lot of right-of-way constraints that would make it very expensive. So the idea behind this video is, if we have to build a whole new alignment just to get high-speed rail from DC to Boston anyway, why not just go all the way and build the fastest technology available? Don't roll your eyes, I know what you're thinking. This is fantasy land stuff and we should be focusing our advocacy on more practical things. And sure, maybe, but this is also going to be a good way into thinking more about value of time and economic benefit, and also drawing more funny graphs. And if this channel is about anything, it's about funny graphs. Also, even though I've spent what feels like years of my life making videos about North American high-speed rail, things are still just moving at a snail's pace, so eh, maybe it's just time to move the Overton window. 
Quick aside, there actually is an effort underway to implement some of what I'm talking about. And I want to be clear that this video makes no representation that any of the viewpoints I'm sharing are endorsed by Northeast Maglev, which is an actual organization that's looking to implement a starter segment between DC and Baltimore with a stop at BWI with ambitions to link further north. Just on the off chance that you're thinking this isn't a serious effort, I'd just point out that the project does have a draft EIS, completed in 2021, and it does have staff and an advisory board with some actual heavy hitters on it. And the chairman and CEO of Northeast Maglev has one of the all-time great headshots. I mean, I'm ready to give these people all my money right now. I didn't read the whole DEIS because who has time for that? But I gleaned enough to realize that most of the assumptions are based on using the exact same technology JR Central is currently constructing between Tokyo and Nagoya, and I'll talk more about operational characteristics later in the video. And just to be clear, what Maglev isn't is Hyperloop, which was also proposed to connect DC and Baltimore in 15 minutes. But unlike Hyperloop, Maglev is a technology that actually exists, and not an imaginary one that was basically dreamed up in order to undermine investment investment in actual transportation solutions that function perfectly well in other countries. When Hyperloop was first floated, it was going to connect New York to DC in 29 minutes. Then it was going to be autonomous vehicles that travel at 150 miles an hour, which the Acela already does in some segments. And then it was probably just guys driving Teslas in tunnels at 25 miles per hour if Vegas is any indication. Let's review this triangle diagram I used to illustrate the travel time benefits of different modes at different distances. If this is new to you, the best explainer is probably in the video I did earlier this year where I looked at the most important connections for high-speed rail in North America. But the basic idea is each mode has a different y-intercept, which represents access time and startup time, and a different slope, which is the speed of the vehicle once you get underway. So driving, low startup time, but not very high speed. Air travel, very high startup time because of how difficult airports are to access and how much time security and boarding take, but very high speed once you're en route, and high speed rail which starts seeing some advantages at 50 miles. The advantage peaks at about 250 miles and then air travel closes the gap and assumes the advantage around 7 or 800 miles. So now let's layer in maglev and I'm taking these assumptions from what we know about the planned operating characteristics of the Chuo Shinkansen. It's got a lower y-intercept than high speed rail because it gets up to speed and decelerates much more quickly and then it tops out at a much higher speed. So even though the travel time advantage over flying still peaks at 250 miles, it declines much more slowly with parity around 1700 or 1800 miles. At this point, a reasonable question you might ask is, so what? Why does any of this matter? So let's talk about how adding a maglev service would change the dynamics of intercity travel in the northeastern US. First of all, here are all the scheduled commercial flights between every major airport between Boston and DC for a typical weekday in October. You can pause and count the little airplanes if you want, but it's 450. Acela already mitigates a bit of this. Like, there are more flights from Boston Logan to the New York City airports than there are from the three DC and Baltimore airports combined, which I think is because the Acela runtime between DC and New York is so much faster than the runtime between New York and Boston, even though the distance is about the same. But the point is, the massive travel time advantage of Maglev, which we'll talk about more in a minute, should take just about all of these planes out of the air, which would be a huge environmental benefit and a huge operational benefit for for the airports themselves. Like when I developed a linear formula for estimating air travel time in my last high-speed rail video, basically all the OD pairs that included New York were above the trend line, meaning those flights have extra schedule padding in them. And I just suspect that eliminating the over 200 flights a day that go to other Northeast Corridor cities might help with that. And this isn't just about New York. The Northeast Maglev folks say that half of all national airline delays originate in the Northeast Corridor. Raise your hand if you've had a flight delayed because the inbound plane was late departing from the East Coast. Here's another factoid. The NEC contains 52% of the nation's worst highway bottlenecks. A lot of current intercity travel in the Northeast does consist of driving trips, and it would be very cool to free up some of that capacity by moving those trips to a much more efficient option. There are really so many ways that a service that tops out over 300 miles per hour could benefit the Northeast corridor, but it's really about improving quality of life, giving people their time back, and bringing our cities closer together, and in a minute, I'm I'm going to illustrate all of that. 
Quick reminder to click on all this stuff if you're enjoying today's exploration of a very cool thing that seems unlikely to happen in your or any other living person's lifetime. Lots of ways to connect, and Patreon is really where I'm getting the most useful topic suggestions and travel recommendations these days. Okay, let's talk about the most obvious benefit of maglev, which is that it saves people time, and exactly how much we'll get into in a minute. I'm not going to try to convert time savings into economic benefit because that's way beyond the scope of anything I can do here. But I just point out that not only do different people value time differently because of social economic status, but even individuals have different values of time in different contexts. The best example of all this is the different seating options on a commercial flight, and the fact that some people are willing to pay thousands of dollars for a bit more elbow space and leg room, and quote unquote free food and beverages of due dubious quality. And you could say they opt for first class because their time is more valuable, but it might be more accurate to say that a few thousand dollars just means a lot less to them. The bottom line is you can replace dollars, but it's fair to say that time is a finite resource. So depending on ticket prices, Maglev has the potential to bring almost unimaginable benefit to the Northeast. And on a macro level, that means not literally reducing the distance between cities, but certainly reducing the friction between them and vastly increasing the network effects along the corridor. That all gets very theoretical, but given that there are entire sub-disciplines in urban and regional planning that deal with things like industry clustering and the spatial organization of metro areas, cutting travel times between cities by like half or more seems kind of important. So for this next piece, I'm relying on a mix between the travel time assumptions I use in the triangle diagram and the operating characteristics documented on the Northeast Maglev website, including the draft EIS, which assumes up to eight trains an hour in each direction between DC and Baltimore. And what we're gonna do is compare Maglev to the existing transportation options for a trip from DC to Boston. The setup here is our travelers starting at the White House and they're due to appear at noon at the Boston Common. I'm not going to create a whole backstory or rationale for this trip. Just go with it. First, let's dispense with the highway option. I don't know why you would ever do this to yourself, but if you plug in noon as your preferred arrival time at the Boston Common, Google is going to suggest that you get on the road at 3 a.m. And I don't know if that accounts for rest stops or food. Super fun. So let's try the Acela. I'm saying that the train that gets into South Station at 11.39 a.m. is going to be sufficient because it's about a 12 minute walk from the station to the Common. That train leaves DC Union Station at 5 a.m. and the Metro doesn't start running until 5 so you're probably going to need to catch this X2 bus at about 4 a.m. Still very early but you get to sleep in an extra hour compared to driving and well honestly you can sleep on the train. Try that in a car. Air travel, again, let's work backwards. It looks like we need to be on a Silver Line bus at 11.27 a.m. to be able to get to the Common on time. So I'm gonna say the 9 a.m. American flight out of National Airport, which is scheduled to land at Logan at 10.53 a.m., is gonna be sufficient. I wanna be at airport security at 8 a.m. at the latest because you never know. So I'm gonna be walking out of the White House at 7.18 a.m. to catch the 7.27 Blue Line from McPherson Square. So much better from a pure travel time perspective, but if you're someone who can work remotely on the train, it still might be a worse option. Now let's look at the maglev. The Northeast maglev cites a 15 minute travel time between DC and Baltimore and an hour between DC and New York, which honestly seems a bit conservative given the operating assumptions of the Chuo Shinkansen, but I'm okay with being conservative on this. I went ahead and extrapolated a whole northbound schedule, and the draft EIS assumes a frequency of eight trains an hour, or every seven and a half minutes at peak times. Keep in mind, this is just for the initial operating segment from DC to Baltimore. I'd assume much, much more demand as the line gets extended north. So I'm calling this a two hour trip from DC Union Station to Boston South Station. And no, I cannot say for sure that those would be the actual stations. I'm just choosing the most obvious. So I'm guessing there's a 937 train that you can catch at Union Station that'll get you into South Station at 1137. That requires you to walk out the door of the White House at 901 and catch the red line at Farragut North at 911 AM. So you're basically getting around two extra hours of sleep before you even start the trip and presumably a smooth, comfortable ride north with 120 minutes to get work done. Read, watch YouTube videos about Maglev. Why not? The world's your oyster. 
Here's a summary of each trip we discussed, color-coded by the phase of the trip, and showing the duration of each segment where applicable. There are other things I could have covered here, like taking the bus, or what a true high-speed rail trip would look like if Acela didn't just slow to a crawl in some segments. And regarding the maglev trip, I do want to point out that at over 400 miles, DC to Boston is still well over the optimal distance, but because the travel time advantage decays so slowly, it's still a big, big advantage. And again, you can say this is all fantasy land stuff, but Japan is building it. You know, there's a time when the US was always the spirit head of innovation, whether it was technology or culture or our space program, or say the industrialization of the fine dining experience. The New York City subway and our national passenger rail system were once the envy of the world, believe it or not. And maybe now that we're done with Hyperloop, we can just get back to building great stuff again. And speaking of the space program, there's a company that went from building parts for the Mars rover and the International Space Station to applying all that ingenuity to dramatically improving the shaving experience, meaning a better engineered razor that saves you money and reduces clutter, and that's today's sponsor, Hanson Shaving. And I'm going to talk about the product itself, which I am a huge fan of, but the other thing that appeals to me so much about Hanson is they have a pandemic origin story just like this channel does. They they started manufacturing and selling razors in 2020 when the pandemic forced their family-run aerospace machine shop to pivot in a new direction. They went from making parts for satellites and space probes to making a really great razor out of aerospace-grade aluminum. I really love the story itself, but also it's a fantastic product. You see, when you buy a cartridge or a disposable razor, the blades often aren't supported or stabilized well, which means the blade is going to vibrate and flex, which leads to skin irritation and mediocre results. The Hanson razor though, it is super precise, it's a safety razor that's built to very tight tolerances, securing the blade at a 30 degree angle with 27 microns of blade exposure, which is going to give you an optimal shave in every way. Another thing is sustainability. There's no plastic involved, including the packaging, and it's really the opposite of disposable. It's built to last a lifetime. And this part's important. Hanson is not a subscription service, so they're not trying to send you monthly cartridge shipments, which would be super inefficient on transportation. Instead, Hanson's idea is you have one really good safety razor, and then blades that cost next to nothing. Compare that to a plastic disposable razor. Over 2 billion of those go into the landfill every year, just in the US alone. And my favorite part, the cost of ownership. This is the part that sold me because you know how much of a sucker I am for graphs and charts. What you see is the upfront capital cost of a Hanson razor is a bit higher than what you'd pay upfront for a cartridge razor, but the blades for the Hanson run about 10 cents compared to two to four bucks each for cartridges, so it only takes about six months for the Hanson to come out ahead on combined capital and operating cost, and then you're in the black from there on out. Even better though, if you use my code, Hanson will send you your first 100 blades for free. That's almost certainly going to get you at least a year of shaving, so you'll come out ahead even quicker. To take advantage of the deal, make sure both the razors and the blades are in your cart at checkout. So if you want a great shave with a very cool space age safety razor that'll save you money year after year, use the link down in the description and don't forget to use my code. Your face, or whatever it is you're shaving, will thank me. And that's all I've got. Thanks for joining today, and thanks as always to the patrons whose direct support lets me work on the stuff I want to work on. Detroit visit coming up the first week of September. Be on the lookout for information. Keep the great topic suggestions coming. I'll be back with a new episode next week, and I'll see you then.